um, which is where we were. Uh, yeah, that thing is loose now. So, you know, like I said, you can follow me around like in a mega church with the, you know, with the stage cam and everything, right? So, and <laughs> I'll get the fog machine going and all that kind of stuff. It'll be good. I need my intro song. Right? <laughs> It's just the Imperial March. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? Thursdays. I should have an update. Uh, excuse me, Tuesdays. I should have an update on the on the new syllabus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be Thursdays, and we swap things around. But the dates should be all correct now on the syllabus. Yeah, yeah. So sorry if you printed out the old one. That was a whoopsie on my end. To, you just um, play with us. No, no, that was uh, me and Dr. Dr. Tong kind of uh, trying to figure out the correct dates that would work best. So. so will you not be proctoring the exams? Not every exam. So it, it'll, we'll see how it works. Like, to be fair, this is the first semester we're going to be doing this, so we'll have to kind of play by years to see what's, what's, what's going to work out best for everyone. Um, anyway, uh, we were uh, going through how to draw structures, which is going to be the primary mode of communication that we have here. I, you know, when I ask you guys to show me a reaction or show me a mechanism or how does this molecule behave or what are the properties or uh, how do we name something or yada, 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 all those kind of things, right? That's going to be conveyed in a manner through just how we draw these things, right? So it's going to be pretty darn important to be able to draw Lewis structures, right? And uh, last time we went through and talked about one of the most important checks, which is... Formal charges. charges, got it, right? And what do we say about formal charges? Where they are a formality, right? So they are a way for us of examining how, or excuse me, uh, when there are, let's say, unusual circumstances with the formal, uh, uh, with the Lewis structures, okay? And what we're going to find in just a little bit, if I remember to do it, right, is that the formal charges lie to you. That what? sounds cool, doesn't it? No. No. Okay, but what did I say about them? They're just merely a formality. Say, hey, something weird's going on here. Pay attention and assess it, right? Um, so I'll show you a very common instance of where formal charges lie to us, sort of. But uh, anyway, then we were getting into um, how do we draw the three-dimensional structure, and we talked about the idea of how structure and function are inherently related, right? So we have to know the structure of something before we can start to assess what its function is going to be, right? Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good kind of uh, summary there. Um, oh, uh, there is something I want to mention. So uh, I, I'm going to, I should have mentioned this earlier. Um, if you guys have been following around, uh, along in the book, which I hope that you guys have, you'll see I'm kind of hopping around between basically chapters one, two, and four, okay? Um, I usually try, like chapters one and two are kind of just all the Gen Chem review in my opinion. So I'm kind of bouncing in between there to tell a good coherent story. Uh, we're about to hop into chapter four here for a little bit, and then we're going to go into chapter three. But once we get through these first four chapters, we'll pretty much just be following directly from what the book is there, okay? So um, I know I think the syllabus has that all laid out clearly. <coughs> okay? <laughs> Don't look too close. <laughs> right? But uh, the reason why is just because, you know, I... I Anyway, I want to build up the whole point of drawing things, and that's what chapter four kind of gets you guys at there too. So uh, I apologize if it's a little bit confusing. Um, I'd be happy to kind of point you guys what sections uh, we're actually dealing with in the textbook there. But uh, so, but we are going to be covering the first four chapters, just not necessarily in the order right now, okay? But once we get through that, then we'll be right back on track. Sound good? Okay. Um, Okay, yeah, so let's get started with some prayer and then uh, we'll uh, continue chatting uh, about our structures here and how to draw them. Uh, but Lord, we just thank you for another opportunity. Uh, we, we, we just thank you, Lord, that whenever we want, we can just turn to you for a conversation, for some prayer time, for advice, for counsel, for just airing our, our thoughts to you, Lord. And uh, we know that you listen to us, every one of us, Lord. And we just thank you for that gift, uh, that the creator of everything just uh, listens to us. Uh, Lord, help us to be just cognizant of that fact. Lord, just help us to understand what that means and just how that reflects your love for us, but also for everyone else. Uh, Lord, that we just pray for those who don't know you and for those that you've entrusted for us to share with. Lord, just give us those opportunities to talk with them and about the amazing things that you're doing in our lives, Lord, and everything special that you've done for us. 
Help us to be good and faithful servants. Just help us to be good stewards, Lord. And just help us to seek after you in meaningful ways each day, Lord. Help us to be deliberate and intentional with our actions, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 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 All right. So, CH4, okay? One of the standard molecules, one of the standard compounds, kind of the go-to point here. We said that if we have a central atom, the carbon, right, and we have four things surrounding it, okay, that the structure of it, the molecular geometry, is going to be what's known as a tetrahedron. Okay, a tetrahedron has three-dimensional shape. It exists outside of a two-dimensional plane. Okay, and so we have to bring in these contrivances, these wedged and dashed bonds, to represent the three-dimensional geometries with these. Right? So that's what those wedge and dash bonds are. Good? All right, so scrolling back in your notes, okay, last time we went through and we looked at nitrate. Right? So hopefully we can quickly work through what the Lewis structure for nitrate is going to be. Have it drawn quite a few times. Remember, whenever you guys draw a Lewis structure, get in the habit of drawing out your formal charges also. Okay. So there's that. We have a central atom. We have three things surrounding it. Okay. So if we have three things surrounding a central atom, here we have a trigonal planar, is what's going to be the geometry here. Okay. So trigonal planar, three. Things in a plane, okay? Of course, we need three things to define a plane. That's kind of where the name comes from, yes? What are the bond angles in a trigonal planar geometry? 120, okay? So when we draw the molecular structure, we try and get as close as we can to the actual bond angles that are in there, okay? Sound good? All right, so the angles here, right? 120 degrees. Of course, those are the idealized bond angles, right? think this one should be rather self-evident, okay? We have carbon dioxide, okay? We have three things, three things define a line, right? If they're on the same, you know, uh, with the 180 degrees in between them there, so we have a linear geometry, right? Now, why am I telling you guys this? Why am I bothering with all this stuff? Because you're going to put it on a quiz? Well, yeah, but... We have to know where the electrons are, okay? And electrons are going to be around the atoms, so we have to know where the atoms are. We have to know the relation of the atoms to each other. This is going to be something we get into a little bit later, more in the second semester. We're going to talk about intramolecular interactions, what happens between atoms bound in the same molecule. So we're going to have to start to think about how close atoms are to each other, okay? It's kind of like the telephone game in a way. Right, if I ask you guys to share something with your neighbor, you can just turn to them and talk with them. Okay? If I ask Maria to say something to Samantha all the way in the back there, right, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. You guys are going to have to get up and move around and find each other first and then share the information. It's the same thing with atoms. If they aren't close together, okay, then they can't interact with each other. If they can't interact with each other, then they can't react with each other. All right, so shape is going to define our function and reactivity. Yeah. Is the steric number a defining characteristic of the molecular geometry? Yeah, so yeah, so hang on to that thought real quick. Right? I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. You guys with me on this? Are these the only geometries that are available? No. Trigonal plane or linear? Tetrahedral? No. No. So these are what I tend to call the, uh, let's say, the parent geometries. Okay. So if I have four atoms, okay, so, well, well excuse me, I'll back up. If I have four things surrounding a central atom, if I have four things surrounding a central atom, it's going to prefer to adopt a tetrahedral geometry. Now, if you remember from general chemistry, we talked about electron pair geometry, and we talked about molecular geometry. You guys remember those two terms? All right? And we talked about that there are five dominant electron pair geometries that we learned. Linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, 
trigonal bipyramidal and octahedral, right? And your electron pair geometries are always going to be one of those five. The molecular geometries are dependent on how many lone pairs versus atoms you have. That's starting to scratch the rust off there a little bit. Do you guys remember this stuff? Here's what I mean. Draw the Lewis structure for ammonia, okay? NH3. So draw the Lewis structure for ammonia. Draw the proper molecular structure for ammonia. Hydrogen in the middle, right? If we drew, if we draw our Lewis structure, we should end up with something like this, okay? How many things are around that central nitrogen? Four. Four. Got it. A lone pair and three atoms. So what should its molecular? Excuse me. What we would call its electron pair geometry be? Anytime we have four, we're dealing with tetrahedral. Got it. So what will the shape of ammonia look like, broadly speaking? The exact same as methane there, right? The CH4. You guys with me on this? Right? Anytime we have four things, it's going to have the same general shape. So if you remember what I told you guys, I'm just erasing this for, for to keep everything on the same page, right? Anytime you want to draw something tetrahedral, it's always going to have the same basic setup, right? We've got something central, two, one wedge, one dash, two straight lines, okay? Um, Doc, did you say that that's molecular or lone pair geo? Well, this is the, I'll, I'll emphasize the point just a second. Okay. So there's our three hydrogen atoms, and we can put our lone pair up there, right? Now, hang on. Don't draw this one quite yet. Have you guys ever seen a bond to a lone pair? No. No, right? So traditionally, what we do, if we have a lone pair, we just draw it right around the central atom in a way like that. You guys with me on this? Yeah. Okay. Do you guys see how I drew that? I started with the same thing that I draw for any tetrahedral molecule there, and then I just fill in what I had. Good. Now, let me offer some confusion and that'll be self-evident as we go through. Whenever I ask you guys to draw the structure of something, implicit, because we're dealing with organic chemistry, I'm saying, hey, draw this in the proper three-dimensional shape, okay? So I'm gonna try and be very specific with this in class and on the exams and that kind of, and, or excuse me, on the first exam at least. But in the, like going forward, you guys will very quickly see them. Just like, you have to be able to just know what this structure is. We don't really care about Lewis structures all that much, okay? They're very important information, but we need to also make sure we understand what the shape of things are, okay? So Lewis structures are kind of more of a construct for general chemistry. I'm not saying they don't have their worth, but you know, moving forward in this class, as we get to more complex topics, we're just gonna have to assume that we're dealing with molecular structures. Does that seem fair? Okay, everybody with me on that one there? So catch me if you guys are still kind of confused what I'm asking us to draw here. But, uh, um, you know, just from my own habits, I, if I say draw something, I'm telling you, show me the shape and all that kind of stuff too. Okay? Good? So I had a couple questions that popped up here and there. Yeah? Um, electron pair, or is it a lone pair geometry or molecular? Yeah. So... Here's what I mean, right? I said that there are five electron pair geometries, right? They're always going to be linear, trigonal planar, right? Tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral. What's the shape of this? The shape of this is tetrahedral. That's typically what we think of with a electron pair geometry, right? How many total things are around there, okay? What is the molecular geometry of this? Well, now we have a central atom, excuse me, we have a central atom Three, lone, uh, three atoms and one lone pair around it, right? So we would just call this uh, trigonal pyramidal is what it is, okay? So trigonal pyramidal. So let me see if I can start to make a, a list here. So under tetrahedral, okay, if we step down one, trigonal pyramidal, okay? 
and we can step down one more to get another geometry that is a subset of tetrahedral. Okay? Do you guys catch what I'm doing here? Four atoms around a central atom, three atoms and one lone pair. So the next step down is going to be two atoms and two lone pairs. You guys with me on this? We're just removing an atom and swapping it from a lone pair each time. Yeah? Can you list the lone pair geometry one more time? I'm, I'm getting to it. Oh, okay. oh, oh, lone pair geometry, sorry. Okay. Uh, so linear, trigonal pyramidal, excuse me, trigonal planar, linear trigonal planar, right? tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and okay. octahedral. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They should be in your textbook also there. I'm pretty sure they are. Okay, so what's a very, very, very common molecule that everybody knows that they've drawn a million times and has two atoms and two lone pairs around a central, let's say an oxygen maybe. Water, got it, right? So if I ask you guys to draw water, do you need me to? Say no. No. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully you guys can do that, right? But if we drew out water, we would see it has a bent geometry, okay, is what we would call it. Good. What if we have one atom and three lone pairs around something? Well, then it's just linear. That really doesn't exist too much for us, though, right? There's a couple of random examples here and there. But you guys with me on this? All right, this is going to be your electron pair geometry, right? And then we just step down each time we add a lone pair, excuse me, remove an atom and add a lone pair in its place. Good. So we can do the same thing for all the other ones. Trigonal planar, three atoms around a central one. So why don't you guys take a second, right, and draw the, the Lewis structure for SO2, SO2. Draw the proper shape, all that kind of stuff. So I have 18 total electrons, six from sulfur, six from each oxygen, right? Are you with me on that? Mm -hmm. Least electronegative in the middle, connected to the oxygen here. Okay, so we've used four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay, I still have two electrons. Where are my next two electrons gonna go? On the sulfur in the middle, got it? Are we done? No. no, what do we need to do? Okay. Check our formal charges. Okay. Well, before we get to the formal charges, real quick, right? Remember, one of the checks is, hey, does everything have an octet? Right? Mm -hmm. Remember, does sulfur have to exclusively obey the, obey the octet? No. No. Right? Should we kind of start at the octet? Yeah. yeah. Right? So sulfur only has six around it, so we probably need to make a double bond. All right, so just to draw an arrow as practice, that's all I'm going to do. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Right? Just to save space, I'm getting rid of that. But you guys got it, right? There it is. Okay. Everything has an octet. I can do formal charges, yes? Mm -hmm. What's my formal charge on the oxygen on the left? Negative one. Negative one. Yeah, what's on the sulfur? Positive one. Positive one. Oxygen on the right? Zero, okay. What do the formal charges tell us? It's a neutral molecule. Well, they need to add up to be a neutral molecule because that's what we started out with, okay. What do formal charges tell us? Hey, pay attention. There's something unusual, right? Do we have formal charges? Mm -hmm. What should we be doing? Trying to get rid of them. Paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. There is a formal charge. We should say, hmm. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Can we mitigate those? Can I do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
could, but it would over it would make sulfur positive, which would give it positive two. Sulfur doesn't follow the octet rule though. But it wouldn't be neutral. What are my formal charges on my new drawing? Zero. Over here it's what? Zero? Here it's positive zero, two. here it's zero. Hmm. Okay. What's the relationship between what I drew there, between this and this? Are they both valid Lewis structures? Yes. Yes. So what's the relationship between those two? Did we move the atoms around? No. What did we do? We moved electrons. We turned lone pairs into bonds or bonds into lone pairs. The relationship is? Resonance structures. Got it. So which one of these is correct? Both. Which of these ones exists more often? Aha. That's the question to ask. You guys with me on this? Mm -hmm. Good. Now, following the rules that we have established, which would we say is the better Lewis structure? Probably the one on the bottom here, right? I think there's a couple reasons that we'll talk a little bit more about as we go through this, right? For, but for our purposes right now, we can assume this to be the correct Lewis structure just for the purpose of the conversation too, okay? You guys with me on this? Did, we, did I change any rules on you to get to this answer? Did I follow the rules that I talked to you guys about in class? Did you guys not follow the rules that I talked about in class? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Feeling guilty, eyes dart darting all over the place, huh? Follow the rules, okay? And we'll get you the right answer. Sound good? If you follow the rules, guess what happens? Smiles. I hand back your exam, okay? You get a 93, that's pretty good, right? 93, yeah. okay, smiley, okay. If not, I hand it back, you get a 39, okay? It took me too long to grade. I don't wanna put all that red ink on there. I think I told some of you guys from my Gen Chem class, if you weren't with me in Gen Chem class, I've got pens that have that has glitter in them, okay? When you make me mad, I'm gonna use glitter on your exam, right? It's a great passive aggressive way to, to get to get back at somebody. Right? Send them a letter in the mail and put glitter in it. Right? Ah, damn it, right? It spills everywhere when they open it up, right? They get mad, but they learn their lesson. Don't open mail for me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But I'm saying, look, I'm I'm telling you guys how not to make mistakes, right? So follow the rules, check the stuff, think about formal charges, all these kind of things. Okay? Sound fair? All right, so hang on just real quick. Okay. Now, this, we're not done with this quite yet, right? Because what did I say? What is the geometry of this? Our central atom has three things around it, one lone pair and two atoms. The overall structure, hang on a second, the overall structure, right, is trigonal planar, right? That would be the electron pair geometry. What are the ideal angles in electron pair geometry? 120, okay? So ideally, as long as we have three anything around a central atom, it's going to be 120, all right? So the same thing kind of holds about what we talked about previously, right? If we wanted to, whoops, sulfur, right? If we wanted to talk about something ideal, right? We would put our two oxygens, a lone pair, right? Around that central sulfur there. You guys with me? This is the same thing we did for that tetrahedron. Obviously, we don't put a bond to a, a, a lone pair there, okay? So we just kind of come back and do this right here. What would we assume the angle to be there in between the two? Still, still 120, got it? Is everyone following what I'm doing with this? I'm trying to prove the point that we have one geometry and then as just we add or remove things, we kind of step up or down in our list. Good. Okay, so I saw a bunch of questions. I think I had another question there at the beginning. So sulfur does not need to follow the octet. Doesn't rule. need to follow the octet rule, correct. Um, is, is, which atoms don't follow it all the time again? Everything, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine exclusively follow it. Okay. Everything else okay. doesn't. Yeah. Don't lone pairs take that the larger bond angle? Yeah, there? hang on to that thought. Um, why is it? So we're talking about what the overarching geometry would be, the electron pair geometry, okay? Is this trigonal planar though? No, this is bent, right? When we are dealing with, right, when we're dealing with the molecular geometry, we only look at the atoms themselves to define the shape, okay? But what really defines the shape? 
own pairs do. Okay. Why? Why do things adopt 120 degree angles? Why do they adopt 109.5? Why do we have shapes to begin with? Yeah. Because it's the they want to be the max. The electrons want to be the maximum distance away from each other. Got it. That's all it is. This is the maximum distance atoms can put between themselves, aka the maximum distance electrons can put them between themselves. Good. Does everyone follow what I'm saying with this? We have electron pair geometries, we have molecular geometries. Electron pairs define our shapes and our angles. The molecular geometry is what we really care about, where the atoms are, okay? Am I saying the lone pairs aren't important? No, but I'm just saying when I talk to you guys about a shape, I'm gonna be talking pretty exclusively about the molecular geometry. Hey, this is trigonal planar, or this is you know a trigonal pyramidal, these kind of things. Good, is that confusing? Yeah, a little bit, right? Why is it confusing? Well, maybe this is only the second time you heard it. So what do we need to do? Review. Practice it. Got it? You guys with me on this? So if we go back up here, bend, okay. What if we remove something from a linear geometry? What will its shape still be? Linear. linear. With me on this? So how many practical shapes are we really going to, ooh, hello. And how many practical shapes are we really going to be dealing with? Linear, bent, trigonal planar, bent, trigonal, right? Six, can you guys remember six things? That's no. Five. That's five. Okay, but well, there's, yes. bent, there's two bents. Perfect, so what do we need to do when we're talking about bent things? Now if you take a look in the textbook, uh, some textbooks, good textbooks, they'll talk about bent 120 or bent 109. Guess what that 120 or 109 refers to? The, the angle between the atoms there, right? Whether it comes from tetrahedral or whether it comes from trigonal planar. You guys with me on this? Mm -hmm. So do I need you guys to know those six? Should you guys be able to draw those six? Yes. Which of those six necessitates the use of wedges and dashes? Well, anything that's part of the tetrahedral set there, right? Until it doesn't. Draw water for me real quick. Have you guys drawn water before? Have you ever drawn it with a wedge or a dash? You. Ooh. Yep. But isn't that because since water has a bent geometry, even though like it might be tetrahedral, you're not gonna draw the lone pairs with with like um, dimension. And so like if you assume that the lone pairs are in the same plane, then you would just be drawing like one um, one hydrogen coming out and one hydrogen going in, but at that point it just makes sense to have them in the same plane, right? Sure, yeah. All right, so I got a thought for you here, or maybe a couple of thoughts. Okay, we're really gonna shake things up, okay? Yeah, what's up? It is. Yeah, it is. I want you guys to draw that for me real quick. Okay. Is this a trick? No. Are you sure? Always. I want you guys to draw me the correct molecular structure. Wedge and dash it up. All right. Everybody get that? No. No? 
So you guys did something like this, right? No. No. So you're saying I'm wrong. No, there shouldn't be, shouldn't, aren't there lone pairs on carbon? No. 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 So you guys maybe did something like this. Right, ignoring all, I imagine there's lone pairs in all those corners. I just don't feel like drawing them all the time. <laughs> right? Did you guys do something like that? Yes. What's the relationship between all those? They're all the same thing. They're all from different perspectives. Got it? Is this important? Are these unique molecules here that I've drawn? No, no they're not. Molecules move in space. They tumble, they rotate, they vibrate, they twist. All these kind of things, okay? Every single bond, right? So every sigma bond has free rotation. This is gonna be extremely important, okay? So I'm extremely important to remember. Every sigma bond has free rotation. Once we get into pi bonds, they're not gonna freely rotate, and that's gonna be also important. But these are all identical things here, right? This is just a rotation of this. Right, so if you imagine if I pick this up, right, so I pick this up and I just twist it, and I can set it down right there, okay? Now for those of you guys who are like, this guy's nuts, okay? This is why one of the recommendations is to get a model kit, all right? Do you have to get one? No. Did I make it through without a model kit? Yeah. Is it because I'm some brilliant genius? Yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Can you guys use a model kit on an exam? No. Sure. What? Okay. I don't care, use it. Right? Are you telling us we can show up with model kits and just like freaking play? Yeah, but like, you know, like toy, like train model kits, right? So if you want to bring your choo-choo with you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, you can bring a model kit. What's up? Um, wait, so model kits, like, are they like different models? Like, what is the in the first and the second mm -hmm. molecular structures, um, both chlorines are closer to each other, and then in the last one, it doesn't matter. No, he's None of these are closer to each other. Oh, What's the idea? Now, I'm not a great artist, right? They're all 1 to 9.5. They're all 1 to 9.5, right? I'm not a great artist, but the assumption is that, you know, if you guys deal with my bad drawings, I'll deal with yours, right? You understand I'm trying to represent a perfect country heat right there, right? So everything is 109.5. These aren't closer than those are, right? These aren't closer than those are over there. None of this is all the same thing. I'm just twisting and tumbling it around. What's up? Can you say that thing about sigma bonds? All sigma bonds freely rotate. They're just spinning like crazy. You guys already knew that, right? Because how do, how do molecules store thermal energy? Well, they store thermal energy through motion, right? Bending and stretching and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, all the chlorine should have the electrons around them. Yeah, yeah. I just I just left it off just because of fun. Yeah. But that's a good point, right? So assume that I just have lone pairs and all those there. Hopefully you guys can fill those in, right? You guys with me on this? Mm -hmm. So these are all the same molecule, right? So can we represent tetrahedrons in different ways? Sure. But notice what's the same between all of these. There's always what? Two linear bonds, one wedge and one dash. You guys with me on that? All I'm doing is kind of twisting and tumbling things around. Yeah? I just have a quick question. Sure. Chlorine is like in itself is negative, right? And hydrogen is positive. So does it have to be. What do you mean in itself? Like, if you look at the periodic table, chlorine is negative. I'm not picking on you, but I'm going to ask you a question that's important. If I look at the periodic table, there, everything is neutral. Okay. So what are you asking the question about? What specific property? You can say that in English, I would appreciate it. Yes. Okay, so what property are they trying to ask about? Electronegativity, right? That's what, right? So I promise I'm not picking on you two there. Like, it just, it's, it's, this is something that you're asking a very important question. I just want everyone to kind of draw in on it is what it is. So now that we're dealing with electronegativity, now ask your question. Okay. So should, when we draw this structure, yeah. example, do we have to put chlorine, hydrogen, chlorine, hydrogen? No. Okay. They're all 109 from each other. This is the point that I'm trying to make. 
Is there any point on a, te on a tetrahedron that is unique? Right? Could I take, could I put a chlorine here instead? Sure. Could I put a hydrogen here instead? Sure. Right? These are all the identical things. We're just looking at it from different sides. What it is is this. If I ask you guys all to get up, go stand in the, uh, in the yard out there and look at the building. Would you guys be looking at the building? Sure. If I ask you guys to get over there and in the parking lot and look at the building, are you still looking at the building? Does the building change? Mm -hmm. No. What changes? Your perspective. Perspective, right? You are moving something around. We don't change anything. We don't change the properties, right? We don't change the boiling point. We don't change the melt, right? We don't change any of that stuff. We're just changing perspective. This is one of the key tricky things to start to learn in organic chemistry, how to visualize things, how to tumble things in our mind, okay? How to walk from one side of a building to the other in your brain, okay? Yeah? I don't think there's any limit to giving John Lewis structure. It like matters what's next to each other, where the, there. The answer is it doesn't. It doesn't? No. That's, that's what I'm telling you. All of these points are identical. You can add whatever, you can put any of those there. It's right? like if you're sitting around a round table and you've got three people, who's next to who? Everyone's next to everyone. So position doesn't matter. For now. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm done for the day. That's all I want. <laughs> Chapter five, we will talk about when it does. And it's actually really, really, really important then, okay? So I'm leaving out a bit of information. If you take a look at chapter five, there's something called stereochemistry, okay? And that's gonna be extremely important. And the reason why I picked this example here is to particularly avoid an issue that we could run into. As soon as I give you guys another tool, then we can start to assess somewhat more complex molecules, okay? But the point right now, and I think we've kind of hit it with all the different questions, right? We can change how we draw a tetrahedron, okay? All the angles in there are still 109.5. They're still all identically spaced from each other. Everybody with me on this? This is important. Now, how do you get better at visualizing things in three-dimensional space? One, you can get your model kit, okay? Yeah, yeah right? Can she use that as a test? I'm can you use it? <laughs> Can I'm you guessing. use an instrument that's a tad, you know, that can uh, access the internet on an exam? I'm going to go with uh, no on that. <laughs> what if I just use chemsketch? What if I, I don't know, you guys look kind of shady. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right, but uh, the point being there are free bits of software you guys can use to model things in three, in three dimensional space on your computer, right? And you guys can rotate that, tumble it around, these kind of things, right? Um, I think there's even, they're starting to develop apps now with all like the VR stuff that's coming in, right? So you can, mm -hmm. you know, put on that helmet looking thing and then, uh, you know, manipulate things in a different way. I don't, I'm a professor so I can't afford those things, but if you guys, <laughs> if you guys have access to that, go for it, right? Now, just as a quick this and that, okay? You know what the, you know what one of the best ways to improve your visual acuity is? to play video games, all right? So there was a test, or there was a study that was done not that long, a couple of years ago at this point, I should say, where if you play first person shooters more often, you're, it's better for you to kind of, it's easier for you to visualize things in three dimensional space, right? That kind of makes sense, right? You know, a, a video, I'm, like I'm a big dork for video games, right? So I kind of grew up with them all, all my life. So it's just kind of like, I look at a flat screen TV and we see depth in them, right? We can rotate things in our head, we can draw maps and all these kind of stuff. That's essentially what we're doing here, right? We're just rotating things around, twisting things, okay? So if you guys want to go buy a PlayStation over the weekend and start practicing your organic chemistry, you know? <laughs> the fact there you that go, right? Yeah. Like, if you ask me right now, how do you get from this classroom to the church, I wouldn't know how to do it. <laughs> okay, you might be Asian. So, so it's a condition where you literally can't visualize. No, I know it but, is. I just, I probably can't see it. All right, cool. <laughs> so anyway, but the point being this, you cannot, this is important, Andy's leaving. Oh good, now we give all the answers. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> Andy knows this stuff, it's all good, right? So the point being, I've already talked to him before, so I mean, right? So what I'm saying is we have to be able to visualize stuff, okay? Have to, have to, have to, have to. Is it just a, hey, you know, if you guys aren't, aren't doing anything else, please, you know? No, we're gonna have to be able to visualize this stuff in three-dimensional space, okay? I know, 
Andy as well. Anybody else interested in going to dentistry school? Right? Okay. So just because I'm a bit kind of sort of. Am I starting to question everything by drawing dichloromethane for you? <laughs> Things took a turn. No. Okay. <laughs> Listen. So because I'm a uh, because I'm a big dork also, right? So I took one of those like DAT exams just for fun, right? One of the dentistry school application tests, right? Wait for fun. Right. Uh, what else are you gonna do in Ave, right? Freaking <laughs> you. <laughs> So anyway, a big part of this exam is actually all visualization. They're going to say, here's a shape for one angle. What would it look like from the other side, right? Why would they ask you guys that on a uh, dentistry school exam? Because what happens? You're trying to clean somebody's teeth. You're looking at one side of it. Do you have to imagine what the other side of the tooth looks like? The top, the bottom, the left, the right, those kind of things, right? So that's just a practical example that sticks out in my mind, right? But there's plenty of things in life, right, that kind of, you know, uh, uh, require this kind of visualization to go along with it, okay? So, but this is one of the big stumbling blocks that come up first in organic chemistry, all right? So now's the time to start practicing with that, okay? Sound good? Cool, question. Oh, sorry, I need to talk about one more thing before we move on to the, to, to the really good stuff. So we talked about molecular geometry and all those kind of things. And I had a note of hybridization, I put a question mark there for you guys, right? What is hybridization? Remember, I asked the question, okay, we have 109 degree bond angles, we have 120, we have 180, nowhere in there do we have 90s, which is what we would expect to see if we were just going off of the angles based off of our, our atomic orbitals. Electrons make bonds, okay? Electrons live in orbitals. We only have S, P, D, and F, and we know that the angles in between them are 90. So how in the world do we get to things like 109 and 120 and all these kind of things? That's hybridization, okay? What's hybridization? Hybridization is when you want to paint your room purple, okay? And you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, which everyone's watching. I'll sponsor you guys next time, right? <laughs> <laughs> we'll sponsor right? Yeah, yeah. What about right? Menards? Okay, sponsored yeah. by Lowe's. Menards. Uh, so you go to uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, and they don't have purple paint, <gasps> but they have red and blue. So what can you do? Mix them. Buy a gallon of red, buy a gallon of purple, uh, excuse me, red, red and blue, and you mix them together and you get purple. With me on this? Let's think about this for just a second. Hang on. Right? Work. All right, never mind. Yeah, what's up? Don't they, instead of carrying like actual colors, don't they just carry like a bunch of white and like drop the dye? They sometimes do. Thank you. All right, so ignore my example, okay? They don't have, ever, they don't have color shortages. <laughs> All right, so, right? So we have a gallon of red and we have a gallon of blue paint, okay? If I mix those together to make purple, how much purple do I have? Two gallons. Everybody with me on this? Now you guys know this because that's conservation of energy, right? Wouldn't sure. that technically be conservation of mass? No, I'm saying conservation of energy, right? Because energy is everything, right? Everybody with me on this? Can I create or destroy anything? No. No. So if I put two in, I better get two out. Follow me on this? So now for stepping away, I'll draw something here in just a minute. I'm walking you guys through kind of verbally here. So now instead of mixing paint buckets, now I'm mixing orbitals. If I mix an S and I mix a P orbital. It hates you. Okay, you good? Sure. <laughs> All right. So instead of mixing red and blue paint, now I mix an S orbital and a P orbital. I mix one and one. How many should I get out? Two. two. Guess what we will call the mixed S and P orbital? An S P orbital. You guys with me on that? I'm so confused. So just like purple has properties of blue and red, this S P orbital is going to be what? Properties of S and the P that's in there. You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. That's all hybridization is. Good? 
So if I have my red bucket of paint, right? And blue bucket of paint, right? Uh, I don't have a great purple. You'll have to set that up next time, but hopefully this will make sense, right? It's not my left. Right? We have two gallons of purple that come out of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So doing the same thing here, we'll just represent S orbitals with the red, right? And we'll just represent a P orbital in blue, just to keep things kind of simple, okay? Oops, 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 oops. Now remember we talked about shading in orbitals. We have positive and negative ends, nodes, yada, 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 all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. So now's where the mixing becomes important. We assume that shaded things have the same sign and unshaded things have opposite signs. Waves at the beach, right? We have constructive and destructive interference. As you've learned about this maybe in physics or at least seen it, you know, a couple examples, these kind of things. If I mix an S and a P, these two are going to mix together in a way to make that bigger, and these two are going to mix in a way to make that part smaller. Follow along? No. Here's what it looks like, okay? So one end is going to get bigger, the other end is going to get smaller. Okay? You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. But how many orbitals do I make? Two. Two. Okay? Good. Now the question might be, how do I know? Why are they shaded? Why is it off? And all this kind of stuff. Just take my word for it for now. If you want to know those answers, come see me in my office. I'll be happy to explain it to you. Okay? I don't really care too much about the shading right now. I'm showing it to you guys because that's the way things work, okay? What I want you to understand is that hybrid orbitals have properties of both of the orbitals that go into it. If you put two in, you get two out. Good? What happens if I put three in? I get three out. What happens to my color of purple? I mix one S and two P orbitals that purple becomes a little bit more blue, right? You guys with me on this? What if I mix one S and three P orbitals? I still make purple, but it's more even more blue. What does the more blue part tell us about the orbitals themselves? They have more characteristic of P orbitals in them. Makes sense, right? Do you guys see what I'm talking about, how this paint kind of just helps describe what's going on with hybrid orbitals? That's all it is. What I put in is what I get out. If I put in two gallons, I get two gallons out. The more of the P orbitals I put in, the more P characteristic the hybrid orbitals carry. That's all it is. What does that mean for us? A couple of things, okay? So what we can have is SP, SP2, SP3 hybridization, okay? Why? How many S orbitals are we only ever going to have in our valence shell? One. One. How many P orbitals are always available? Three. Up to three. Do I have to mix all of them? No. Not necessarily. You guys with me on this? How many hybrid orbitals come out of an SP3? Well, I have one plus three, so four. I make four hybrid orbitals. What lives in orbitals? Electrons. Electrons. What makes bonds? Electrons. electrons. So if I have four orbitals with electrons, how many bonds can I make? Four. Four. Eight. Got it? So what geometry is sp3 hybridized? Tetrahedral. That's all it is. Okay? That's with me? Tetrahedral is sp3 hybridized. If I'm sp3 hybridized, I'm tetrahedral. Good? What about sp2? What geometry am I? I have three orbitals. Right? We are trigonal, trigonal plane. plane. That's all it is. Okay? Good? Yeah? What about octahedral? What would that, would that involve these? We'll deal with that when we get to it. But yes. Question. If I'm at sp2, I mix 1s and 2p orbitals. Right? To get sp2. How many p orbitals are always available though? Three. Three. Got it? So what happens to my third p orbital? If I don't hybridize it, what is it? A lone pair. 
No. It's just a p orbital. Could it be a long pair? Maybe. But it is an unhybridized orbital, right? You guys with me on this? What about for sp? I have an s and one of the p orbitals. How many unhybridized orbitals do I have left? Two. Two. Okay. So plus p, plus p. Everybody with me on that? Mm -hmm. I want you guys to use keeping this in mind. Okay, keeping this in mind. I want you guys to go back at the Lewis structures that we drew here. Okay. Ah, tetrahedral, 109.5. What's its hybridization? SP3. SP3. Good. Are there any unhybridized p orbitals? No. Mm. No. What's up? I'm a little confused about the hybrid, the SP plus P plus P. So yep. Even if there aren't electrons filling the uh, full P orbital, it's still represented? Oh, yeah. Every atom has access to every orbital available. Excuse me, I should be very careful what I say here. Even a hydrogen atom has access to D orbitals. Right? Yeah. Yep. Are they ever going to have electrons in the D orbitals? No, they're way too high energetically, right? What I'm saying is all orbitals always exist, okay? The, the more electrons we add, we can start to access more of them practically is all it is, right? So even if we don't have electrons necessarily in those orbitals, we still have those orbitals available is what it is. Yeah? Can, can you explain how you got like the plus P again? Those are just the orbitals that we didn't mix, okay? We always have three P orbitals available. To make SP, I just mixed an S and one of the P. So I have two of those left over. That's all. Because okay. that's how the, the periodic table works, I guess would be my short answer for that. That's what they always have access to, even if they don't have the electrons for it. Yeah, as soon as you hit the P block, you gain access to the PX, the PY, and the PZ. Right? They're all equivalent energy. Okay? Degenerate is what the word that we use for it is. Okay. okay. Good. Everybody with me? Made good observations? Okay. So taking a look at nitrate there. So ignore SO2 for just a minute. Taking a look at nitrate and taking a look at carbon dioxide. Could you guys tell me the hybridization for those respectively? Yeah. Sure. Right? Trigonal planar, there's three things around a central atom, so I need three bonds. What hybridization gets us three orbitals? SP2. Good? Not too bad, right? I could ask you the same line of thought here, right? What is, pre and if you go through and take a look at everything that we've drawn so far, I'm trying to get you guys to look at a pattern. One of the most important things we can start to ask for any science, right? Looking for patterns of things, okay? What is present in SP2 and SP geometries that you will not find in SP3? Hmm. What differences from what we've seen drawn versus the tetrahedral stuff here? Now, I'm not talking about the atoms, right? We can give examples of whatever atoms there might be. But there's something very specific that we see here. Aha. Uh -huh. Where do double bonds and triple bonds come from? They come from unhybridized p orbitals. Got it? Are we going to see double bonds for a tetrahedral carbon? No. no. Could we see double bonds for a tetrahedral sulfur? Yes, because it's not going to have an sp3 hybridization. Okay? So remember, what am I trying to point you guys at? Can I give you answers for everything all the time? Yeah. No. <laughs> Can I give you answers for the predominant things that we need to pay attention to? I hope so. Okay? Yeah. So would another way of phrasing that be if you have unhybridized p, an unhybridized p orbital, it will become a pi bond? That's a fair statement. Okay. Marie? Uh, so, would sulfur become more than four, like, in terms of 
Sulfur so is like so annoying. He'll just have whatever it wants. Longer or something. Like, so would that still be unhybridized if it has a double? If sulfur is in the middle and has a double bond, but is in a Yeah, good question. Man. <laughs> sulfur just does what it wants. So right? when we get beyond our, um, let's say our exclusive hybrid, our, our exclusive octet following things, right? We start to see that hybridization falls apart a little bit. So what does that tell you about the theory of hybridization? It's incomplete. It's all a big old pile of BS, okay? Bachelors of Science, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right? I'm just being honest with you. It's all a lie. So am I teaching you guys things that have no value? No. Absolutely not, okay? Because how do we actually calculate what's going on? It takes a long time, okay? So why am I telling you guys this? Because hybridization is going to be extremely useful and extremely important, and we have to do it very rapidly, okay? So it's a very good tool for assessing what's going on in a molecule. And so we need to have something quick to develop that. We can't do what's known as molecular orbital theory all the time, okay? Hybridization theory is a short, excuse me, hybridization is a shortcut. Do we lose things when we take a shortcut? Yeah, yeah we do sometimes. Part of what we need to understand is what its limitations are, and that's what my job is to kind of walk you guys through that. Hey, we can use it in this case. Hey, we can't use it in this case. That seem fair? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're just starting to pay attention to those kind of things, right? Hybridization, useful, okay? So um, when we have pi bonds, double bonds and triple bonds, we need to have unhybridized p orbitals available. And this has some implications, some important implications, okay? So let's take a look. Okay, at our good old buddy, okay, nothing. Let's take a look at our good old buddy, carbon monoxide, okay. Now, we'll go ahead and draw the Lewis structure here. Good. What's weird about carbon monoxide to begin with? Carbon has a lone pair. Mm, that's pretty unusual. How many times have we seen carbon with a lone pair? Not too often. What else is unusual? Oxygen has a positive formal charge. Yeah. If you go through neutral formal charges, that's what it is. Ooh. That's not right. That's pretty unusual, huh? Mm-hmm. So Can we draw a better Lewis structure? Yes. No. no. <laughs> so that does that mean that oxygen is wandering around in this molecule with a positive charge on it? Mm. No. Okay. Because hmm? I'm doing a formal charges, and formal charges are a? Formal. Right. Got it? It's a thing for us to say, hey, there's something unusual here. I should pay attention. When is oxygen going to feel positive? Not very often. In fact, it's the second most electronegative. So it's only ever going to feel positive when it's bound to fluorine. Got it? Okay. So there's a difference between electronegativity, formal charges, electrostatic potential. Okay, your book talks about that, right? Where your negatives and positives are. Okay. But this is going to be useful for helping to predict how carbon monoxide can react. Okay? Yeah. Um, I can take a peek here, right up. It, it's in chapter one. There we go. So if you have your book with you, I can kind of find it in this section there for you too. One point nine. Okay. What's up? How come there's like a triple bond? We're getting to that. Yeah. Okay. Everybody with me on this? It's linear geometry. If you're linear, what's your hybridization? That's P. How many unhybridized P orbitals do I have then? Two. Two. How many pi bonds do I have? Two. Is that a coincidence? I think not. No, right? So we talked about previously, right, that in, uh, just to color code things, red is my sigma bond. <clears throat> For practical purposes, where does the electron density 
of a sigma bond reside? Between the two atoms, okay? So if I draw my carbon, I draw my oxygen, I have some area of sigma bond electron density between the two atoms. That's not quite exactly how it looks, but work with me here for a minute. Good? Where are my pi bond orbitals? Yeah. All around the molecule? Not quite all around, maybe sort of. Hmm? Above and below. Above and below the plane of the atoms. Okay? So I wish I had a brown color to kind of make this work, but you guys are going to have to just work with black, okay? So we see my two black orbitals there. They are above and below the plane of the atoms. They are my hamburger buns to my sigma bond. Good. Now notice something. I have two areas of density here. Remember how does a p orbital look? A p orbital looks like this, right? It's got two lobes on it, right? So the black, the black areas here that I drew just represent one of those pi bonds that I made. What are the angles between my p orbitals? 90 degrees. So just to color code something here real quick, uh, let's do it in orange. Where would my orange orbitals be? They'd be in front and behind, right? They'd be coming out of the board and behind the board. You guys with me on that? So let me see if I can do this the best I can. All right, they'd be coming in front, right? Man, this is, this is a great drawing. <laughs> and behind. I promise the book has a much better drawing of it than I do, okay? But you guys with me on this? These are all 90 degrees from each other. So if you imagine we have an orbital above and below, can you imagine a four bun hamburger? Right, you have hamburger buns on top and on the sides. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Yep, okay, but that's what it is. Why is that important? Real quick, this is one last point. Why is it important that we understand that the pi orbitals are above and below the plane of the atoms? What lives in orbitals? What does chemistry? Electrons. Electrons. Which are the first electrons that are going to react? The things that are further away or in between the atoms? In between. What do you think we're going to learn how to react first? Pi bonds or sigma bonds? Probably both. Right? <laughs> right? But the point being, pi bonds are going to behave differently than sigma bonds because of where they're located. Sound good? All right, I will see you guys on, uh, oh, tomorrow, right, for lab. So see you guys tomorrow for lab, if not on Friday.